welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Dion and this is Neil and we are really excited to be here with you today and share our presentation entitled Othering and International Humanitarian Work and Research, Perpetuating Power Asymmetry Between Us and Them. So to, in order to sort of start us off in our presentation today, we thought it's important to sort of um, kind of identify who we are in relation to the work, talking about the work we do in humanitarian work, uh, research in humanitarian and in development contexts. Um, and so I'm, I'm Neil and I'm a white man from the US. Um, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And um, I think naming this sort of, I want, we wanted to name our identities to sort of um, conceptualize, to, to think about the ways our identities impact the work we do, especially cross-culturally or in humanitarian uh, settings. And more specifically, this, this presentation is very conceptual in nature. Uh, we don't have, you know, empirical evidence to to support what we're what we're arguing in this presentation. Um, we we hope to at some point, but at this point, it's a lot of coming from us. So I just wanted to sort of to name that. And yeah, I'll just touch on who I am and the identities that I bring into this work. Um, I'm black, uh, African from a, a country called Rwanda. Um, I'm a woman and came to this country, the US, as a refugee, but have become an American citizen. And I am a student um, at UNC Chapel Hill as well, studying public health. And one of the thing, things that really sparked this work and informs the work that we'll be talking about today is our time in East Africa. Um, and so just understanding that um, I have a little bit of background culturally and personally with that region of the world. So othering, we are defining othering as a process of separating or distinguishing and stigmatizing groups of people based on any of the various aspects of human identity, such as ethnicity, skin tone, gender, uh, socioeconomic class, sexual orientation, and so on. Now, it sustains power asymmetry between groups, creating an us versus them uh, way Social distance is essential. Now it's important to note and acknowledge that those with power, the us, have historically been in many contexts, white, wealthy, heterosexual males, uh, with the other or the them being all those who do not fall in those categories. Othering then is a way of maintaining power and negating the humanity or the humanness of various groups of people. So uh, just before we continue, I just got a little message saying the internet connection was unstable. Can folks see us and hear us okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so so here, um, as Dion mentioned, we're, we're sort of questioning and looking at the ways that humanitarian workers or, you know, researchers in humanitarian settings or um, in, in sort of the global South are, is there an othering divide there? We're, we're sort of arguing that there is. And so for this slide, um, particularly, we're gonna present this in, in a very generalist sort of binary. And of course, there's much more nuance in this, which we'll, which we'll talk about later in the uh, presentation. But at this point, we wish, just wanted to, to sort of map out what we're thinking when we talk about othering in humanitarian contexts. So in one instance, you have the humanitarian worker, researcher, et cetera, right? And the other, you have the beneficiary, the one who's receiving sort of uh, the support, if you will, right? And again, this is very general. We're, we're painting a very broad strokes, general picture uh, intentionally. It generally, or lots of the time, you have the humanitarian worker coming from, you know, Europe, North America, Australia, et cetera, from the global north, um, coming in, right, as this helper, as this person and um, 
position really with power and privilege and being, you know, with virtue and this active agent, you're, you're here to, to help, right? And, and the beneficiary um, is usually, excuse me, usually from the global south in need of quote unquote help, right? As seen as passive in some, um, some ways, which we'll talk about and um, has historically faced, um, has, you know, from countries that have been colonized and where there is sort of incessant subjugation and oppression. So othering as, as Dion sort of talked about is, is very broad and it, big conceptual terms. Um, and, and so what we, we've been in conversation a lot uh, through our work and through talking, and we really thought for this presentation, it would, it's interesting to sort of parse out othering into these two different um, sort of ways or systems of othering, one being individual or more micro leveling othering. So that's sort of how the individual in humanitarian contexts uh, might other, but then also how the structure is rooted, um, is, is how, how systems and institutions um, other by being in, in settings, right? And so, so we'll get into all of this, but we don't see these two as mutually exclusive. There's a lot of intersect between the individual and the structuring. And so what we wanted to talk about in our time today is sort of how individual and structural othering sort of uh, is perpetuated and, and sort of exists again from our perspectives um, in sort of global literature, in media, and in our, um, our lived experiences. So a lot of the work that I do um, specifically is with um, populations of folks who've been forcibly displaced due to armed conflict um, in East Africa. And so as a lot of the work I've done uh, in the, in, you know, just, just seeing in readings and writings or uh, how these folks, this general group has been conceptualized, talked about, right, as passive recipients of aid, of aid, these sort of helpless victims in need of extra help, right, or we're seeing this sort of quote unquote flood of migrants. So given my positionalities and my identities, if I'm going to, to be about uh, engaged in work in East Africa with uh, forcibly displaced communities, I wonder how reading about all of this, these passive recipients, these helpless victims, then informs my research or my time in these particular contexts, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm coming in with the notion that these folks are helpless, that they're in need, and here I am. Right, so so we're already separating a distance here. There's an other. I'm I don't I'm not a passive recipient. I'm not a helpless victim. So we see that, and and you can see the image here that sort of shows this quote unquote flood of migrants. Yeah, and like the literature, media and the images that we consume also reinforce this othering, the separation of the humanitarian worker and the beneficiary. Um, these images are from two different global contexts and yet they are very much similar in what they're conveying, um, what we've been discussing. We have the humanitarian worker portrayed as active agents, um, be it handing out water or calculating food distribution on a clipboard there. Um, and this is contrasted with somewhat passive recipients. You see individuals receiving or waiting on aid. And I wanna note here that there were many other images that we came across that were more overt in their othering than these. But even in these somewhat innocuous photographs, these photographs that are used to recruit humanitarian workers or solicit donations, these reinforce what we've just heard Neil speak about in the literature, portrayals of beneficiaries as helpless victims or passive recipients. And it's also important to know that our critiques or analysis of this media through this lens is not a new thing. 
Uh, there has been extensive literature and dialogue about this, um, about the consequences of such othering in this way. As Kennedy here notes, it perpetuates an us helping them narrative. So I think Neil touched on this, but what we've been wrestling and reflecting on is how does consuming literature and seeing these images that portray workers and beneficiaries in a vastly different light, how does that impact individuals um, like us as researchers or other humanitarian workers when they go, go out into the quote unquote field? Um, how does this impact their thinking and how does this perpetuate othering? both at the individual level and the structural level. So we talked a little bit about um, some of the literature and, and media representation. And then as we talked about, this is you know primarily conceptual and theoretical, though we do support it with the literature. Um, th this final piece is, is largely anecdotal from our experiences, although they were separate, we both have done work in, in East Africa. And um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about our sort of experiences of the ways in which othering manifests, at least from our perceptions within these contexts. And so I was in um, Kakuma refugee camp most recently in Kenya. And I have spent some time in Uganda as well. It, right, and I also worked up in northern Uganda um, in with forcibly displaced folks from from the civil war there. And as I noted, I'm originally from Rwanda and have um, done some research in Kenya and Tanzania around um, intimate partner violence prevention. Um, and so that's the lens that I'm bringing. Yeah, so as Neil said, we saw othering manifest in many ways when uh, we were there and actually participated ourselves in some ways in, in that. Um, and it manifested through accommodations, food and transportation um, that we as researchers or humanitarian workers had access to. So with regards to accommodations, generally uh, workers, humanitarian workers live in secure and guarded compounds as shown in the pictures here. These compounds are separate, if not in distance, in spirit from where the beneficiaries live. Um, and they include homes with air conditioning, electricity, and internet. Yeah, so uh, specifically when I was in uh, Kakuma refugee camp, the, the compounds as they're called, where a lot of uh, staff workers, researchers were staying, um, were, were very similar to what uh, Dion is talking about these these you know electricity, air conditioning, and that are these are sort of right up against the camp, which uh, these compounds have more sort of security and and protection and these big walls around around these structures. And within these compounds, there is just much um, there's you know, lots of accommodations or, or, or lots of um, qualities of life that folks uh, would have in other places, but not that are very disparate from the, the beneficiaries. And, and based on, I, I chose not to live in, in a context like this. However, every, not everybody, most people that I interacted with living in the refugee camp just automatically assumed that I lived in the compound because of who I am and who I was, right? So there, there's a big disconnect there. We also saw this othering in food and uh, we see workers and humanitarian researchers frequenting re restaurants that um, cater to Western food or food from the global North, be it pizza or gourmet coffee um, that I, I love. Um, and at these spaces, uh, in these places, the prices would be um, completely inaccessible to beneficiaries or other individuals in the area. And so they weren't, they weren't in those spaces. Um, and finally, we also do see a disparity in transportation with humanitarian workers many times having access to these large and clearly identifiable um, air conditioned SUVs or trucks. Yeah, and, and this was especially 
prominent, both in northern Uganda and in, in the refugee camp where uh, in Kakumo, where you would see, as um, Dion said, these large white SUVs with air conditioner conditioning just sort of going down the, the dirt roads and while other folks, the beneficiaries are walking or on bicycles and the, the SUVs just sort of take precedence and, and dust comes from all over the vehicle, all over the people. And it's just sort of symbolically represent, represent, representing what uh, we're, we, we seem to be talking about. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying that these aspects of living are inherently bad or negative. We just want to bring some consciousness around it and interrogate a little bit of what we witnessed and, and, and took part in um, how these seemingly innocuous aspects of life, be it where one lives or eats or their transportation, we, we're arguing that this subtly or overtly perpetuates othering in these spaces. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we broke it down very generically between the global northerner humanitarian worker and the, and the, the beneficiary from the global south. However, it's not that simple as we've noticed, as we've been reading about and talking about. But we, we you know, there's this a whole other notion of the national or local humanitarian worker, right? For example, um, and, and, and sort of the ways in which this hierarchy forms based upon identity and positionality and, and uh, where folks are from, right? So for example, um, in both Northern Uganda and in uh, Kakuma refugee camp, I really noticed the ways in which the, the othering is both individual and structural. And what I mean is this, in with humanitarian development work, you see payment uh, salary inequities, right? So you have the global northerner coming from Europe or or North America or etc., receiving vastly um, more money than uh, the national or local humanitarian worker who could be doing very similar work, right? And they might even, although they might be living in the same context uh, in the compound, um, there is a divide, generally speaking, right? Where the where the North America, where the where the Europeans and the and the folks from North America are sort of congregated together, and the local or national folks. Of course, there is this is this is big generalizations. There is nuance, but you generally see this divide within. The humanitarian worker um, uh, structures, right, of folks who are working there. But then, what's what's also striking is to see the the sort of disparities or the inequities between the local, national, local humanitarian worker, and and the beneficiary, right. So, in in this regard, um, like for example, folks in northern Uganda. When I was working in northern Uganda, um, people who were from from the southern part or near the capital would receive hardship payments to be working in the north. Or the same, same thing happened in, uh, in the refugee camp in Kakuma. And so imagine being from the same country, right? Imagine being from um, Kampala, Uganda and working in the north, but receiving a hardship payment, right? Because, the, because it's too, because lifestyle is tough there and hard. And so that inevitably, so, so that's sort of a structure. These are both what I'm referring to seem to be more structural in othering, right? The payment salary, the hardship payment. But then we argue that it actually, in, you know, sort of intersects with the individ, individual othering. If I'm told that, I, that I'm gonna be getting uh, a hardship payment to go work with people in my own country, automatically I think it separates us, right? I'm not them, my, their lifestyle is so, um, is in such disarray that I'm getting paid, not only I'm getting a salary, but I'm getting extra money to go help them, right? So automatically this separates, I'm not them. So that's sort of what we were, we were talking about here, but of course the sort of global, the, the global Northern humanitarian worker is sort of the top of 
of all of this. Okay, so we've spoken on how we've seen othering manifest in this work from the literature to the images that we consume to daily living um, and to what Neil just illuminated as far as this hierarchy found between humanitarian workers from the global north and national and local humanitarian workers. Um, we thought though it was important to probe why we think this othering occurs in the humanitarian landscape. And one of the first things that we want to acknowledge is that this othering, like Neil just said, perhaps is not rooted in individual choice. Where humanitarian workers choose to live and eat, the well-documented disparities in salaries given to workers from the global north versus the south, all of these aspects are really dictated by humanitarian agencies. And as Hoodley describes here, there are often rules and regulations in this work. Um, the time that humanitarian workers spend with beneficiaries is restricted or discouraged um, and really defined by this rigid worker versus helper binary. And this is just to say that um, agents, the agency that humanitarian workers have in this discussion or in this issue might be limited. Um, so that's one piece that we wanted to speak to. Um, and it really, really reinforces our understanding of how othering in this context in many ways is structural and really baked into the systems and the fabric of humanitarian work. And so continuing with this conversation of why might these uh, othering happen, we want to bring forth considerations for humanitarian workers and researchers that we personally, personally grappled with in our time in East Africa. Um, now we understand and acknowledge the risks that humanitarian workers and researchers take when entering perhaps in secure contexts and how safety is paramount. Um, so for me, safety was a major consideration in the day-to-day -day choices that I made living in East Africa. And even though um, the East African context is a region I call home and is very familiar to me, um, and I embody this insider-outsider perspective, yet still as a single young woman planning out where to live or what kind of transportation to take back home, that was always a constant um, internal negotiation I had with myself or conversation I had with myself. And so when Neil and I were beginning to discuss this work, um, you know, I began thinking, wow, um, in what ways did I participate in othering by living in the expat, you know, region of town away from the local East African people I was engaging with in my work? And another component we, we sort of talked about was, you know, this, this, for me, sort of this unnecessary suffering, right? I, that's not my reality to live in a displaced context, displaced context, right? So, but I, I chose to in a, in a few different um, reasons, but it, it wasn't always, uh, I don't, I don't want, I, it wasn't always very supportive in, in, for, uh, conducive to my lifestyle since I wasn't from that community. I lived sometimes with without electricity, without running water, and um, constantly just feeling fatigued and headached and um, sort of out of out of sorts in some ways because I wasn't used to the conditions. And I just wonder in in some how that how these uh, factors may have impacted my relationship with with the folks I was working with on the ground or or my work in general. And so would it have been different had I lived in a compound with electricity and, and running water? Would it have made me sort of feel more uh, rejuvenated and, and, co and connected to the work I was doing? Would I have been more present? I don't know. There's, these are just some interesting questions to kind of po ponder. Yeah, and finally, there's this piece that we call or that we spoke to about camaraderie, you know, living, working or doing research um, in a vastly different context than what you're used to can really be isolating. And um, especially when you're engaging in work that is heavy or um, traumatizing in many ways. And so in my experience, um, despite being kind of an insider to this cultural context of East Africa, it was still very isolating for me to be away from friends and family and just the ways of life that I was used to here in the US. And I found that other Americans in the area really became, in many ways, my family. And their homes became a place of rejuvenation, 
um, through potlucks and other get togethers. And thinking about humanitarian work in particular, um, the ability to be able to process perhaps the hardship or the trauma of what you're witnessing with, with colleagues who can relate to you is very much invaluable. Um, and so we just wanna call out this value of camaraderie and how that's formed by perhaps living in compounds or um, living with other humanitarian workers. So um, lastly, we just wanted to sort of close, close out by um, re-acknowledging that this is, you know, primarily based in our theoretical uh, understandings or our, um, uh, sorry, I, sorry, uh, in our theoretic, in our, you know, our perceptions, our thoughts, our, some of our experiences, of course, there's the media and academic literature, but, but really the voices that, that we argue are missing are the beneficiaries themselves, right? These are our perceptions from the outside as, as outsiders of working on, on the other side. So in, in what way, how, are, what are the thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, right? It, can we do some sort of relational research with beneficiaries and humanitarian workers and organizations to kind of all sit at the table to understand um, how to mitigate some of this othering or to even see if it's an issue uh, for, for beneficiaries, right? We don't, we don't know. I think that's, that's sort of what we've been talking about as primary next steps is around um, talking to folks who are on the ground, who live in these, these places, who are receiving the support, right? How, what is this relationship to those folks, to those communities, right? And so how do we, how do, we do that in a, in a relational way? And so we thought about, you know, at eventually being able to sort of look at more participatory approaches to, to ethics in humanitarian organizations. Right. Why are we not all sitting at the table to talk about this uh, is, is how we've discussed this. Um, so that's, that'll wrap us up. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. And um, yeah, we look forward to chatting more. Mm -hmm.